Well, hello again, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's Pastor Mike here. Um, I'm a little bit late on the Bible study. Uh, that sometimes happens. Sometimes Wednesday uh, doesn't work right. And so here we are on Thursday, the 3rd of September. And we are looking ahead to this Sunday, the 6th, uh, and the text. Our text is Matthew 18, 15 through 20. I encourage you to read it. Um, honestly, pause at any time uh, to read the text, peruse the text. Also, to uh, look at the questions. We have seven questions this morning, which is less than usual, which means that uh, there are going to be some interesting questions. But with that being said, just a reminder, periodically I like to remind people of the logic of some of these studies. Now, again, as again, we struggle with groups, how the best way to gather, uh, having the online options for study is good. And the best option that has seemed to come up is this daily discipleship. It's a PDF, so easy to distribute, uh, something the ELCA has had out for a while. It's something that, especially the first sheet, is a lot of trying to dig into the text. And so having a format of looking at it, looking at the text, talking about it, um, having people meditate at home about it, or even then ask me questions, uh, tends to uh, work with this. Uh, the Zoom interactive uh, can sometimes be hard uh, with lag and some of those other issues and finding a time. This also you can do at your leisure. So there is uh, blessings and bonuses to it. None of these options are perfect, but we will focus on the first sheet and I encourage you to look at the second sheet uh, for your own personal uh, journey through scripture. Second sheet really functions as a introspective set of questions is maybe the best term I would use. All the front half is really looking at the text and the time of the text. That is really the personal situations and the life you can live because of it. So then, uh, let us begin with prayer. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for another opportunity to gather together as your people. Open our hearts and minds to the movement of your spirit and have the words that you have given us in your book guide us and sustain us. Amen. All right, so let's get into it. Matthew 18, 15 through 20. So the Gospel of Matthew emphasizes the teachings of Jesus, especially for the disciples who will be called and commissioned to make disciples. Um, yeah, Matthew's got a lot of the teachings. Uh, many of the other ones do, too. Um, but it's interesting Matthew's perspective on things. Now, this Gospel text is concerned about the church and how members of the church live their lives. That's really the focus of this one. In fact, it is the only gospel referred to the church. Yeah. So the word church is not really something you see in the gospels. This is one of the, if not only time that it pops up, one of the rare, rare few. Not a common term. Take a moment to skim through Matthew. Try to identify those passages where Jesus gives helpful instructions to those who are involved with being in the church. Feel free to do that at your leisure. Now, question one. How does the Gospel of Matthew give instruction on being the church? <clears throat> Take a moment. So, what do you think? Well, one of the things uh, that I think Matthew is interesting with is the, uh, how do we put this? The two things I think that Matthew focuses on is both mission and community. Um, again, the Great Commission, go therefore and baptize all disciples in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, is part of Matthew. And there is that deep sense in here of Jesus wanting to teach what mission and even why we should do mission is going on here. And that is the power of the good news to change lives. And uh, in some ways, how to do that. And that's key. The other Gospels does it well, but I think Matthew takes it important. Matthew also likes to talk about community. Uh, how do we live together? Which is always one of the interesting pieces. Um, how can we be community? I mean, Bonhoeffer wrote a great book called Life Together. Um, Again, probably one of the great human struggles is what does it mean to be a community? 
be it a family, be it a church, etc., etc. Ain't easy. But I think that is really part of the central instructions. Obviously, there's probably other minutia and those sorts of things, but I have often had those things sit with me as what Jesus wants us to take for our life together. Um, how to be together, and then also how to uh, go out to others. Now, question two. Would it have been helpful if Jesus had spent more time teaching about how churches are to be organized? Why or why not? Now, there's probably a lot of opinions on this, but here's mine. I think it would have not been helpful to talk about how churches are to be organized. Now, you may ask, why? My pastor Mike, wouldn't it be great if Jesus said, do this? Thank you. Well, one, on the whole, Jesus says that we should do it. That isn't always lived out. That is <laughs> not one of those things. Uh, Jesus says, love the neighbor. We have a hard time with that. Jesus says, feed the poor. We have a hard time with that. Um, they're pretty black and white, or depending on the Bible you use, red and white uh, in that. And he doesn't leave a lot of wiggle room. But we still sometimes uh, disagree and fight with Jesus on those sorts of things. Uh, one, I think that would happen as well. We don't want to be organized that way, Jesus. And that would uh, create a lot of problems. With that being said, that would create problems because, too, it's not a central issue. It is not central, the organization it is not central to the mission or the community. Now, again, how it's organized is not as important that it is organized on some way. And I think Jesus gives us latitude. Latitude to find out how to organize that community, which goes to three. And my third reason why not. Times change. And there's always the struggle of the church of what does it mean to be church today? Now, that might seem interesting. Like, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, when you talk about organization, for a long period of time, it was very loosely organized. Churches were just kind of these gatherings, man. They got together, somebody kind of taught, presided over the sacraments, so be it. Over time, the organization evolved. In medieval times, it was very hierarchical. I mean, the, the Catholic Church still has many of the organizational structures of a very medieval mindset of organization. Um, it was. I mean, kind of the bishops in charge of the priests. Priests run the place. Um, money is owned by the church universal, not by the individual congregations. North America has a very democratic mindset for these sorts of things. Um, again, it's voting. There's a council presidents. Um, some, de some Lutheran denominations have the pastor as the president. We do not have that anymore. Uh, but there's those pieces where it's definitely the organization is very democratic. Some things are voted on by the entire body. And it gets interesting nowadays because even as we try to be very democratic, democratic mindset on the organization, and again, it were structured in a democratic way, even we're a very um, Christian organization, you know what I mean? Where it's like, hey, you know, this is our mission. This is our community. And again, I mean democratic in the broad sense, as in, you know, um, a republic is a democ democracy. A parliament's a democracy. It's very much those concepts of voting and all those other sorts of things. In many ways, you know, uh, a church organization is neither a republic, nor is it really a um parliament nor a true ancient Greek democracy, but it has that democratic philosophy on how do we structure and do those sorts of things, you know? Uh, but even then as it evolves, I've seen some churches that take on a very corporate structure where it looks like a business, where the pastor is thought of to be the CEO um, and all these other sorts of things. Um, even as churches think about brands and what's our brand, um, that's a very business mentality. And I think in the future, um, whether it's good or bad, whether we like it or not, churches will be very organized like businesses. 
In fact, satellites are less satellites of churches and more franchises, you know? And so Jesus gives us room to do what's appropriate at the time. Now, again, is it appropriate? Isn't it appropriate? Ah, your guess is as good as mine. But um, in many ways, certain styles of organization don't work. Some work amazingly well. Our Amish brothers and sisters, man, their organization works pretty well for them. God bless. Um, that was a lot of thoughts on church organization. Uh, some churches are fundamentally disorganized. <laughs> uh, Pastor jokes. He's carrying on. So Jesus knows he has called imperfect and sinful human beings to gather as an extension of his body to continue his mission on this earth. Whenever there are humans, there will be conflict. That's a wise statement. Consequently, Jesus directly addresses conflict in the church. Such conflict is what Matthew 18, 15 through 20 describes. Yep. This is all about the concept of how do you handle conflict? How do you restore? How do you reconcile? How do you do that? And always having that conflict leading to restoration and reconciliation is always just key. So describe conflicts typical in the church. Maybe think about a conflict you've seen Historically, conflicts in church. I mean, conflicts in church can range from many things. They can be about a certain, you know, structural piece, organizational piece. Again, disagreement about that. It can be something as divisive as, you know, carpet, the color of the carpet. Um, I've known certain churches where that really, really got divisive. Um, you know, do we do a building project? Um, in many ways, it's going to sound funny, but uh, from my understanding of history, um, two of the biggest stressors and thus conflict causers at churches is modifying the building and modifying worship. I mean, those lead to conflict. They just, they do. Probably because... There are things that we get deeply invested in. So what is the what is usually the root of the conflict? Take a moment. What do you think? What do you think leads to those conflicts? I personally think that a lot of conflict is caused by uh, the storm of many factors. Um, I don't usually think there's a singular root cause. Um, it's like a tornado or a hurricane sometimes, is that if, if you have, let's say, um, whatever, the certain number of things you need for a hurricane, you get one. But if you don't have all of them there, they can't form. Um, that's just the nature of it. And I think a lot of those things are there too. Um, one, I think uh, emotional investment. If we're deeply emotionally invested in something, we have a stake, we have a dog in the fight, if you will. So if you're deeply emotionally invested in the color of the carpet, in some ways, the, the great cry of that's how it's always been, is an emotional investment. Um, because the emotional investment is in stability. Things around here need to be stable. Even in the midst of the world is not stable. This will be stable. And any of that change causes that, that emotional investment. Um, there has to be an emotional investment. Because in some ways, if you don't care, why, why do you fight about it? I mean, really. If you don't care what your kids wear to school, um, you're not going to fight with them about it. I mean, you're not. Um, you know, some parents are deeply, you know, you got to dress this way, this way, this way. Other parents are like, are they clean? Yep. I right, go to town, man. <laughs> Um, you know, that sort of thing. I think also, uh, besides emotional investment, um, anxiety, stress. Um, if we're not at our best, if we're not at a place where we can see some of those sorts of things, that'll cause it. Um, I think also falling into an us versus them mentality, um, which is part of also being right. Is that we need to be right. We need to win. We need to have this. And that escalates. If, say, you're emotionally invested in something, but 
you're not interested in, say, winning or being right or having it this way, but have finding the solution, conflicts aren't going to happen. Things are going to be constructive, collaborative, and communicative. And if you're not stressed about it, you're not going to slide into that mindset of winning, being right, or having it be that way. And uh, in some ways, um, I think uh, one of the other pieces, and there's probably more than maybe, is uh, clarity of vision. If there is a lack of clarity of what, what uh, our chief concerns are, what we're looking at, what we want to do, um, there can be conflict about other things. Uh, there are more pieces to it, but those are the ones that I often see uh, in these storms. Um, again, because sometimes then people will get emotionally invested in a non-central thing that really doesn't even pertain to much of anything happening, and they'll fight about it. And you'll have a conflict between maybe not the entire church, but small groups that'll argue about something. And and is it is it central? In some ways, we can be emotionally invested in the carpet. Um, God bless, you know what I mean? Uh, we can be frustrated, anxious about numerous other things. We can be concerned with being right. But if you're able to say, on some level, I mean, is this central? Then I can let it go. That becomes clear. Um, you know, all these pieces. And maybe they merge together, maybe they slide together. But I think those are often what are the root causes of conflict. You're getting a lot of yakking out of me today. Jesus does not ignore conflict in the church. It exists. Sin is real. Anyone who believes there will be no conflict within the church is naive to the power of sin in the life of a Christian. Sometimes Christians hurt each other, intentionally or not. Jesus clearly describes the process of dealing with the situation when one member of the church sins against another. The goal is reconciliation and fellowship. Remember their words. I also like the term restoration. Jesus does not address conflicts among non-Christians. Think about that. Now, here's one of these pieces that's not on there I'd like to bring up. One of the great failings of the church, or possibly those sorts of things, is portraying the church as perfect. We sometimes do a bad job of talking to people. And saying that, yeah, you know, we're perfect. We're all in agreement. Boom, 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 boom. On these sorts of things. And that's just never the case. If there's going to be, uh, you heard it before, I call it my pizza rules. If you can't get three people to agree on, you know, what to put on a pizza, you're not going to get people to agree about some other things. And that's conflict. And we forget that. And then sometimes we, we want to look good. We want to try to say, yeah, yeah, we're faithful. And so there is no conflict. But Jesus makes it clear that Christians, it's okay to own warts and all, our ups and downs, our strikes and gutters. We don't need to lie to the world or lie to people. And sometimes I think it's the, the desire to put it under the rug or deceive people that causes some of the trust issues. Someone to meditate. Now, five, when someone gets hurt by someone in the church, is reconcil reconciliation usually the goal? Why or why not? I don't know if usually is a great question to ask. I think sometimes um, it depends on other issues. It goes down to some of the root causes I said. If people are more concerned about being right than being healthy, reconciliation will not be the goal. Conflict becomes about winning and losing, not about reaching out and restoring. Now, this conflict is something uh, about, say, an individual who is actively doing something to maybe cause damage in the community. And uh, they are, again, asked to cut it out uh, and those sorts of things. Um, but, again, sometimes there, there's more of the desire to cut that piece off and just cut your losses than try to work for reconciliation. And that, besides, um, again, working for reconciliation is usually a good goal. Two of the major conflicts, as I was saying, was about being right. This one is also about difficulty. It's too hard. 
Sometimes people balk when something is hard. And dealing with conflict is hard, but it's worth it. That is always one of the key things to understand. And sometimes if we're tired, um, not to be inappropriate, during COVID, conflicts are shooting up. Uh, we're in pressure cookers sometimes. And there's not a lot of mechanisms we can do to release the pressure sometimes. So we run into the problem of that the conflict is there. And we start cycling and not working on reconciliation. We're working on uh, victory, being right, and securing ourselves. But if we're securing ourselves, we don't have to be right. Those are just some of the things as to why it can not lead to restoration and reconciliation. Think about that. Uh, this is not a fun topic. I know that. Uh, again, there are many the temptations to be right, to win. But that, yeah, that's not worth it. What happens if the conflict or sin is ignored by others? Now, this is the interesting one about what if it's damaging the community. And the community just wants to ignore it and pretend it's not there. You know, the elephant sitting in the pew, nobody can, you know, middle between the pews in the middle of the aisle, nobody can get around them, so they got to keep going around sides or zip lining over them to get to the front pews, that sort of thing. Um, or sometimes in families. Again, these are hard topics, um, like with alcoholism. They pretend it's not there. Oop. Nothing's going on there. Um, enabling is another term that could be used there. It continues to harm the community. Um, it, it damages people if we don't deal with the hard stuff. Um, it continues to spread like a disease. If we don't do the hard stuff to, to heal, to do that work, the disease of conflict and anger and frustration spread. We wouldn't know anything about that in our world, would we? Jesus instructs the person who has been sinned against to go directly to the person and discuss the wrongdoing alone. This is not the time to bring third parties into the conversation. Respect the person and go directly. That is an awesome rule of those sorts of things. Don't gossip. Don't go to somebody else. Don't triangulate. Uh, talk to the person. If you got an issue, talk to them. If you have a concern, don't complain to so-and-so down the corner about this person. Talk to the person. That's actually, I think, one of the greatest struggles in the church. We want to talk to somebody else as opposed to the person because it's easier to complain with somebody than to work with the person. If things are not resolved, take one or two others in the church with you. Now, that is to, uh, again, gain support for reconciliation, not to gang up on somebody. You know what I mean? It's not like it's us versus you. No, that can sometimes happen. If that does not work, go to the church. Again, it becomes, it's taking the veil off of it. It's not letting there be a secret but that there's this problem. If things cannot be resolved, the final steps is to distance oneself and the church from that person who did the wrong during. The severance of someone from the body of Christ is a painful process. It is never the goal. Now, the person who has offended is to be treated like a tax collector. Such a tax collector, Matthew, the writer of the gospel. Consider how he was embraced and welcomed by Jesus. Just when Jesus seems to be clear, he brings in grace again and again. To learn more about forgiveness, continue reading Matthew 18. I encourage you. But that's the key thing about the tax collector. That's a key thing. We can view tax collectors as an enemy totally cut off. But a tax collector was viewed as one that the church was supposed to care for and try to reach. Is that it's never that they gave up on the person. It was distancing for health. And it was distancing for the hope of restoration. Not exorcism. To cut them off. Think about that. Sometimes taking a distance or a break is okay. Throughout the process, when two or three are gathered in the name of Christ and his power, he is present with them. How might the conversation change if the presence of Christ is acknowledged from the beginning? How do you think? 
honestly, I think if we did a better job about acknowledging that Christ is here with us when we are in church, when we are dealing with family, when we are dealing with the neighbor, when we're dealing with enemies, I think it would help ground us in our values as Christians. It would call us to approach it in the way that Jesus would and have a much better success rate. I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying that I can always summon up the Christ is present, Christ is here. Um, you know what I mean? Or the Spirit is present. Gosh, I wish I could. I'm not that good. I mean, hands down. But I think there is a grace, even in numerous moments in difficult situations. Like if you're dealing, like when we dealt with people at Hesed House, to keep in mind that in the others, as Matthew 25 teaches us, that whatever you do to the least, you do to Christ. That if you can see Christ in the other, if you can see Christ's presence, that you can see Christ pushing you on, that will ground you. Not in perfection, but in growth and progress. Oh, brothers and sisters in Christ, hopefully in this hard topic you have heard hope. Um, it's a hard topic. I am not looking forward to preaching this Sunday. It's not a fun text, but I can't dodge non-fun texts. We got to do it. Again, to uh, to not talk about it would be just to be as bad as saying ignoring conflict itself. We need to do some of these things. So, brothers and sisters of Christ, blessings to you. Hopefully, again, there was gospel. There was good news. There was stuff to carry you forward. All right, blessings. We'll talk to you soon.